Before we begin this digital event, we want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. As many of us are watching in locations all around Australia, we pay our respects to the traditional owners of the country on which we all live and work. We recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community and pay our respects to them and their culture and to the elders both past, present and future. Hello and welcome to our third episode of Tech Empowered, Microsoft's monthly series that brings you direct access and insights into businesses that are at the forefront of tomorrow's digital innovations today. I'm your host, Shane Baldacino, and I'm a Chief Architect at Microsoft. I'm a Caucasian man and my pronouns are he and him. I have brown hair and brown eyes and I'm wearing a tech t-shirt. Actually, let me just uh, jump up a little bit more. All right, what do you think? drop us a comment in the chat. I'm coming to you today from my home office in Melbourne, Australia. Now, this series has been designed to be audio only. So as always, we encourage you to listen, you know, while you go for a walk or even while relaxing at home or on the couch, simply scan the QR code on the screen now with your mobile device to join. We'll also be answering some of the questions that come through in the Q&A chat. You know, it was great last episode, all the questions that came through. So please take this as an opportunity to connect with us ask some questions to some of the brightest minds in Australia and New Zealand tech startups. Today, New Zealand. Okay, so today we are diving into the world of video-led collaboration solutions. And to take us through the fundamentals, we are joined by Jimmy McGee, Adam Zaccato, and Ben Chartrand from Whipster. Thank you all for joining us today. I think, Jimmy, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Shane. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jimmy. I'm the CEO at Webster. Uh, I once had black hair. It's now sadly more salt and pepper. Um, I'm not sure what colour my eyes are either. Um, and I'm wearing a blue, navy blue polo shirt. Not quite as cool as your T-shirt there, Shane, but it'll have to do. Uh, over to you, Adam. Thanks, Jimmy. Hey, Shane. Uh, I'm Adam. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing here at Webster. Um, my pronouns are he and him. I have brown hair and eyes, and I'm wearing, I guess you'd call this plaid. Uh, today, I'm coming to you live from Portland, Oregon, here in the U.S. Over to you, Ben. Hi, uh, I'm Ben. I'm the CTO here at Whipster. My uh, pronouns are he and him. I have uh, mousy blonde hair, blue-green eyes, and I'm wearing a black t-shirt with an orange ninja a cat on it. So there we go. Um, I'm coming to, to you today from Wellington, as is Jimmy. Great stories, guys. Okay, and some great t-shirts. Love the plaid. Um, all right, so Jimmy, you know, some on the call may be thinking, who is Whipster? You know, for our audience who may not be familiar with the Whipster brand, let's start with the obvious question, who is Whipster? Cool. Uh, so if you go back 10 years ago, uh, video was still in its infancy, and our founder, Rollo Wenlock, uh, was a really big believer in video. He believed that use was going to skyrocket in ways that we couldn't possibly imagine. But he also understood as a videographer himself that collaborating was tough. Uh, it was tough getting the video to somebody in the first place for them to have a look at, but even tougher for them to be able to review the video and provide specific feedback. And the way you would typically do it back then is you know, pause the video and say at 1 minute 24, uh, we need to change the colour and insert an image here. And uh, mythology has it that he saw, he was looking out the window and saw some moving images behind there and thought, imagine if you could annotate comments just on those particular frames as they were going past. And that was really the catalyst for the birth of Whipster. And uh, you fast forward to today and Rollo's prediction was scarily accurate. Videos here, and it's far bigger than anyone imagined. Uh, and it has been used not just where for media and entertainment, where video is the product, it's now the de facto means of communication. It's how individuals communicate with their friends on social media, 
uh, and broad groups. And it's also how businesses use it to communicate with uh, their staff, internal comms. It's the way in which they train their staff, learning and development, the way in which they communicate with their customers, uh, and also spread the gospel to prospective customers. And um, we believe that video will continue to grow. There is uh, more video content being created all the time, uh, strong organic growth, but we're also seeing the impediments to the creation of video being removed, the consumerization of video. And on top of that, you've got flexible and remote working arrangements, which means that video has even more utility in today's world. And so that's why Whipster exists today. We enable big brands and creative teams to collaborate on video-led content so that you can easily capture stakeholder feedback in a uniquely actionable way, engaging the right person at the right time. And we like to think we've got the most simple and intuitive solution in the market. How awesome was that video overlay? I was excited just uh, watching that. It looks fun. You just mentioned simple and intuitive. Looks like it, right? Um, it, it, it is shame, um, but uh, you know we're also pretty excited that we'll be uh, over the next wee while rolling out our new front end. So we've in the last month rolled out our new mobile solution, uh, Responsive Web, and so the look and feel that you would have seen there will be um, usurped pretty quickly. Nice one. Okay, so mythology sounds like it was correct. That prediction scarily accurate for sure. Stars are aligning for Webster. Now, I look at as Webster, you know, having a little bit of a play with it as a means to provide comments and collaborate on video, just like you said. And wearing my developer hat, it's really relatable to me. You know, it's how, as a developer, I'd create a pull request, you know, comment on a change in a source control platform. It's got that, you know, GitHub, Jira esque, you know, in its use. You spoke about video growing, couldn't agree more. Huge growth. You know, we've got last mile internet speeds are constantly increasing, making it easier. Um, and you've got devices that, uh, improving all the time, reducing that barrier to entry. Adam, I'll pivot to you. Can you share some examples of how customers, you know, around the world are using Wister today? Yeah, for sure, Shane. I think a couple that come to mind, I'll give you a few, <coughs> excuse me, brief examples. One would be uh, Marriott, um, Marriott Hotels, and they're using Wister to create um, sales, marketing, learning and development resources. Um, Wipster allows their teams to create and share media assets, no matter where they are, obviously many locations, timelines, languages, and cultures. Um, another one that comes to mind is City, and they use Whipster to coordinate with their L&D, um, as well as all of their internal comms. Uh, and this includes not only video, but documentation and audio. So really that whole gambit of multimedia assets. Brilliant. Uh, lots of varied usage, you know, internal teams. When I think of Whipster, initially I think about, you know, creating external content, but absolutely there's that, you know, angle of, internal uses from, you know, LMS, uh, learning uh, systems and so on. So video is an interesting medium. It's something, you know, in a past life, I've spent a little bit of time. I come from a content delivery background. You know, what are the challenges and opportunities? It's probably a bit of a loaded question because I, I think I do know what they are, but I'm interested from your perspective. What are the challenges and opportunities that come with a video based product offering? Yeah, if I could just jump on there, Shane. Be, um... There are some challenges and uh, Adam, you're probably best place to speak to those, but I wouldn't want to be lost that there is enormous opportunity with video uh, where you can communicate with people, with teams, your customers, with feeling and emotion and create far better engagement uh, in a way that is just uh, light years ahead of what you can do uh, in an offline world. Yeah, and if, if I can add, I think, and, and Jimmy, if you have some experience, many of the stakeholders who are involved in that collaboration and approval process aren't necessarily strong technical expertise. Um, so it's imperative that Webster is really super easy to use, low friction as possible, uh, making that whole process streamlined um, and not having to download or log in, really just clicking and providing feedback instantly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot that goes on. Um, you know, there's a lot of processes in place, you know, enable to get that video ingested, manipulated um, so that, you know, end users can do what they need to do. Um, ben, you know, on that pivot, tell me a little bit more about, you know, what's needed from a technical perspective to bring, you know, what Adam and Jimmy have just described, you know, to life. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I like to think of one example of a customer who was saying that, you know, they're in London, they have might have 48 hours to create and review a video. So what that means is that, first of all, the platform needs to be available 24 seven, pretty much everywhere around the world. Um, security as well is a non-negotiable, it's absolutely required. Um, and reliability is a huge part of it because once again, they're under time pressure. They want to make sure that the that video remains in their hands before it's officially released. They want to make sure that they're not losing precious time because the system goes, oops, you know, I, I'm going to not work or I'm going to take half an hour to transcode a video. But to be more specific, the type of things we need is obviously storage and lots of it. We're at, at the moment we're around 700 terabytes of storage and we're continuing to grow. Um, we need compute a lot of it because all those videos that come in, we're transcoding them. And if you're not familiar with the term, that just means we're converting that into another file format, it's one that's consistent in the platform. Um, we also need to store data just like any other customer, um, any other tech shop. So we need SQL and NoSQL storage, um, hosting for our front ends and our APIs, and yeah, the CDN is a really important part. So um, if we can go into a bit more detail with our architecture diagram. So yeah, this is, um, I guess this is us at a high level. So just really conceptually, um, authentication is a really big part of it. So for example, we have um, enterprise level customers who they want to be able to connect into their SSO. For example, their Active Directory they might have on-prem. Um, so then there's our backend, our, we all have, have all our media storage, our CDN, and once again, that transcoding is an important part of it. But there's, um, if we were to look at that uh, our next diagram, which has more information, this sort of gives you a sense of some of the you know, more features that we have. Um, the features in that we have in the cloud are very important to us because they provide not only the functionality we need, but you know, doing things in a secure and very cost effective way. Yeah, and, and if I can just jump in there and you think about all those different systems working uh, with one another, and if you think about it with any online subscription that you might have, um, it's hard to uh, pass on that um, kind of cost associated because the product is so easy to use. It's not a physical one, um, so it can be maybe perceived as cheap or low cost to create and maintain. Um, so really as a sales leader, it's my job and our job to show uh, the value we provide as well as, you know, all those things that Ben mentioned running in the background. Oh, and look uh, to our backstage producers here. Can we put the uh, architecture diagram back up? Uh, there's a few things I'd love to dive in here if that's possible. But, you know, you mentioned, thank you very much, you know, um, you know, the cost to serve video. Uh, you know, these are large files here. Uh, you've got that proliferation from, you know, 1080p to 4K, even 8K in some areas, different codecs, etc. Transcoding, you know, having to be able to encode for different devices for an iPad versus, you know, uh, a desktop computer, etc. You know, there is a cost to serve here. But when I look at your architecture on screen here, it's almost like a, a single page app. You know, you've got your content delivery coming out through a CDN and you've got your dynamic content going in through to, you know, almost a microservice-esque architecture. You've got an IDP in the form of Auth0. You've got some Azure functions, event-driven computing. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of event driven architecture, basically do something when something happens. It's living the cloud dream. You know, why pay for idle technology here, right? Tivo, um, definitely, you know, uh, don't want to be in store storing, um, you know, secrets, etc. in code. And look to digress here. Um, you know, I have three kids and one of the books I had, uh, you know, kids growing up was uh, Underwear Do's and Don'ts. And at that stage, I was working for a, a Fortune, uh, an ASX 50 organization, and I wrote a book, Developer Do's and Don'ts, right? So it's about, you know, not storing, uh, you know, do not hard code connection strings in, etc. So services like Key Vault, you've got DNS because everything needs DNS, App Insights, right? And that's, you can't move into this world of microservice architecture without really understanding the complexities of, what's happening in your stack. We're talking about reducing feedback loops, understanding what's going on. Ben mentioned, you know, SQL and NoSQL. And I think, you know, it's not either or, or. it's understanding the levers. You know, when, when's it appropriate to use something like MongoDB, metadata here, right? Being able to scale out because Whipster, they want to be really fast. And then you've got your relational database in the form of SQL Server and a huge blob store because 
lots of data. So that is absolutely fantastic here. All right, so look, thank you very much uh, for popping that diagram uh, up. Let, let me just ask, you know, is there anything, Ben, you know, in Azure that you were using that you can't do on-prem? You know, why Azure? Effectively, you know, how is how's the cloud helping your architecture scale? Yep. So in theory, we could do everything on-prem, but we really don't want to. I mean, we could have a large collection of VMs running FFmpeg that we are all having to manage and, you know, having to worry about scaling up, you know, before Christmas, buying more VMs and getting those up and running. That's, we could do that, but it doesn't make sense. We're a small team. The resources I have, I ideally want to be have them focused on delivering customer functionality. So functionality for users or perhaps tools and other services that make life easier internally for our team. Um, we also want to reduce our time to market. The If I can go into Azure and click a button and all of a sudden I have, you know, 10 times more capacity and yes, 10 times more cost potentially, but if it's that easy to scale up and down, then that makes it a lot easier. And I guess that's the key thing. We often talk about scaling up, but it's also a time scaling down. Um, so once again, with things like FFmpeg, we could be using tools like that, but we're trying to use PaaS and FAS offerings. And if you're not familiar with the terms, it's product as a service and functions as a service. So ideally, it's the case of just saying, I got this video, I just want to transcode it, just make it work for me and come back to me when you're done. How you do it and the infrastructure you're working on, I don't want to have to deal with it. Um, it's, uh, I'm aware that it's not necessarily the most cost effective and perhaps if we were many times bigger, it might be worth us investing in our own custom infrastructure. But to be honest, it, it's usually only the very top end of businesses where it makes sense to go off and you know build your own infrastructure or build your own software solutions from scratch for everything. Yeah, excellent. Um, you know, I was actually delivering a session last week about, you know, the economy to serve. You know, what is your liters per 100 kilometers or MPG uh, for yep. the likes of Adam or kilowatt hours per 100 of your cloud architecture? And look, in many organizations, the cost of human labor, it's that most expensive part. So we're talking, you're talking about high value versus low value. Um, you know, what is the perceived value of patching a virtual machine? Probably not that much, right? Mm -hmm. um, and look, uh, for our audience there, drop us a comment in the chat if you've had to capacity plan. And like, you know, Ben, you know, you're reading the reading between the lines. When you do capacity planning, if you've never done it before in this on-prem world, you need a capacity plan to the high watermark. So you are paying for capacity that, you know, you don't use. Ben mentioned, you know, deploy 10x the capacity, maybe 10x the cost. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be. Think about things like, you know, if you are leveraging uh, virtual machines, um, you can have VM scale sets today that can take both on demand and spot instances together. So, you know, leverage a spot market, etc. So that is fantastic here. Um, all right. So when looking to innovate from both a technical and product angle, how have you approached this? And, you know, are you looking at market trends and data? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest thing, if I could just say one thing, is listening. Um, in order to innovate, it's, it's going to be really critical for us to not only, yes, capture um, our feedback and surveys, but also getting in front uh, in person now that it's starting to slowly be allowed, um, but, you know, virtually. Um, we obsess over clients, their workflow challenges. We want to know what's not working and also what else they're using in their toolbox to create. Um, it's really the only way we can be informed is by having those conversations consistently. Okay. Hey, um, Adam, you just mentioned, you know, now that we can get back together, which is fantastic. Has COVID accelerated the use of Whipstone? I've seen a lot of industries, you know, that trend, um, you know, looked on your architecture diagram before, content delivery networks, those OTT players, those streamers, et cetera, you know, massive growth. Given its video, you know, has Whipstar experienced a, you know, a similar uptick? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about even people having events now that once we're done in person, having to move that to um, online and even recording those and repurposing them for marketing, for sales. Um, so that goes hand in hand with what we've been seeing in terms of the uptick in the video. So um, exciting, challenging, but uh, yeah, definitely new reality. New reality for sure. You know, talking about exciting and challenging, there are some things that just, you know, it's almost a ticket to play in today's digital economy and that's security. Customers expect their data to be safe and secure. So, 
you know, security is top of mind for everyone today. How are you making sure that Whipster is secure and reliable? Yep. Well, I guess for us, um, we could say it really starts with, um, you know, our, you know, our processes, you know, we're currently pursuing SOC 2, for example, where we've nearly um, achieved that certification. But what that really means is that we we really bake security in from day one. Like the minute you were, if you were to join Webster, you'd have to go through a whole bunch of training and you'd have to read all our terms and conditions and all our code of contact and all these things. But a lot of it has to do with security. So it's really about setting the culture up front, the expectation that as that anything we do has a very strong security focus. From there, there's obviously a very strong uh, developer centric focus that, you know, the type of things we're doing, we're using the latest, you know, frameworks that are supported, that they're writing good code that's secure, but as well, there's an infrastructural component as well that thankfully by using Azure and by using other tools, for example, like GitHub, it helps make security easier because they help with aspects of it. So, for example, if we're using GitHub, we would have something like Dependabot that will say, hey, you're using a package that's potentially has a vulnerability. And in the cloud, um, we have things like the Azure Security Center and other features within Azure that you know will tell us if there's an issue. But as well, a lot of the best practice from Microsoft is really encouraging us to think security first. And as well as ser services like Key Vault, which also happen to make our life a bit easier, also happen to improve security. So it's really about, you know, treating security as a, you know, pretty much our number one concern. And it really starts from the top, from our policies all the way down to our day to day activities. Fantastic, Ben. So just remember, security listeners is a shared journey. It's a shared responsibility. So if you pop, you know, cloud. Uh, shared responsibility model into your favorite search engine, you know, pop up with, uh, you know, an Azure shared responsibility model. And if you're not familiar, what that model dictates is, you know, who's responsible effectively for what. Now, Ben mentioned before, you know, the move to event-driven architecture, uh, FAS, PaaS offerings. As you move up the stack, your responsibility, you know, in the security perspective, reduces and ours increases, et cetera, right? So, you know, to remove a lot of that heavy lifting, you know, it's another reason why organizations the world over, like Whipster, are adopting the, you know, event-driven architectures, platform as a service, et cetera. Uh, you know, Azure Security Center, you've got the Azure Compliance offering, not only SOC 2 in the scenario that Whipster spoke about, but from PCI DSS through some through to, I guess, more of the local offerings such as IRAP in Australia. These attestations detail what services in Azure are certified. So just remember, you know, by running in the cloud, we do a lot of this heavy lifting for you. But to be clear, certifications like SOC 2, they're at the service level. So the Azure services, meaning the service has been certified. How you construct the Lego blocks that use our services, you know, that is, you know, entirely up to you. But if you aren't familiar with the uh, Azure Shared responsibility model, pop that into your favorite search engine and take a look. Love GitHub Dependabot. That's uh, pretty cool, right? Being able to scan your packages for dependencies. All right, so let's pivot away from the tech here. Given your journey, you know, what tips do you have today for, I guess, more of the early stage startups that may be on the call joining us today? The, the big one for me is uh, ensuring that you've got great product market fit. And for me, that means obsessing on the detail of what your customers are saying and how they're feeling about the use of your product. And you can look at qualitative information, but uh, we uh, spend a lot of time and energy looking at our NPS data. And I'm a bit of an NPS disciple. And so that gives you it tells you what you're doing really, really well. And, uh, you know, for us, uh, workflow and the ability to take content and push it through a defined workflow uh, to reduce friction and improve time to review was a big one. And so we knew that we needed to focus on that. But uh, there are also things that uh, we needed to improve. And uh, those things were uh, reliability. Um, <coughs> where we uh, want, if you're a big customer, then you need to rely on us the whole time. And we are delighted with the progress that we've made with uh, Microsoft's help over the last few months and reckon we've got a great, uh, reliable product. We need to work on mobile and we've rolled that out, as I said at the start of the show. And so uh, I just, that, that is the one thing I would impress upon people, just focus on what your customers are saying, 
what you need to work on, but also just being alive to uh, use co cases that you hadn't actually contemplated. And the you know, we had um, customers who we discovered were using us to distribute content. And they're also using us as a quasi hosting platform and pointing people at them to, to review, to actually view finished content. And so for us, it was really interesting and uh, a way in which we can uh, uh, innovate the product. Uh, you make me laugh there, uh, Jimmy. Um, there's a few reasons, right? So look, I love the fact that you, you know, as I say, you know, you can't improve what you can't measure. So, you know, big believer in NPS, Net Promoter Score, you know, and other methods. Totally, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a war on talent. And that attractive tech stack surely helps uh, the likes of Ben, et cetera, acquire people. But I love the point talking about your pricing dimensions. Um, you know, in the past, uh, I worked for an org and not, I won't say similar, but they were hosting uh, eBay ads on our storage platform. And, you know, the cost for, to host these GIFs, these PNGs, is tiny versus the, the load it would put on our infrastructure. But in terms of pricing dimensions, has anyone seen uh, audience here the meme of how QA people test a function created by developers? So in case you haven't, let me explain, you know, think of a shape of like those child's toys where you place the blocks through the correct shapes. Um, you could probably uh, take a look at this. It's a, I think it's a video, but in this meme, you know, rather than putting all the blocks in the appropriate holes, because they can, they're all putting it through the square. So the point I'm trying to emphasize is, you know, in production, be it Whipster or anywhere else, end users will always find weird and wonderful ways to use your product. Okay, so look, we've had uh, several questions that have been added to the chat. So look, our first question is, um, we don't have uh, the person's name, but um, some really interesting insights on video as a growing content format. With the rise of TikTok and short format videos, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts around the market trends are around this. Uh, so it's really, really clear that uh, use of those different social media platforms is uh, is growing rapidly. And you've got individuals who are sharing content, you've got uh, personalities who are out there uh, using it to communicate with people. And so, um, for us, this is one of the reasons why we are seeing uh, this growth in collaboration solutions that Whipster is likely to be a part of. Yeah. And then one thing I would I'd add to that, Jimmy, is that you know those are typically on the social media side, you're seeing short form, um, quick turnaround. So lots yeah. of content having to be turned around quickly, capturing that feedback. So plays right into kind of what we're suited for. Yeah, and that, that, sorry, that technically has a, an impact as well, because once again, that goes back to our, what we mentioned about reliability. It has to work. It has to work all the time and it has to be fast because these people have a very short turnaround. They don't have patience for potentially things going wrong. Mm. Awesome. I think everything needs to be fast these days, right? Um, my kids have no patience, but all right, <laughs> digressing here. So all right, another question, could you expand a bit more on how the product has changed based on how your customers have used Whipster or changed, I guess, to market trends? Uh, yes, yeah, so just uh, riffing on the point I made earlier, um, where we discovered that we had a couple of really big customers who were using us to share content and as that virtual uh, hosting platform, we then actually tactically changed our value proposition. And uh, you know, if you go to our website today, uh, you will see it is it says um, review, approve, and share. Uh, six months ago, it was review and approve, and so uh, that is something that we will continue to look at uh, because we think that there is real opportunity there uh, to help provide a stickier, uh, more rounded solution for our customers. Yeah. And I guess from a technical point of view, that means that. The engineering team needs to be able to respond very quickly. So as opportunities arise or as a customer provides feedback and we decide to action it, we need to be able to deliver, whether that be, you know, feature flagged functionality that goes out to beta customers, whether it's to all users. So that goes back to the, you know, the typical DevOps story of, you know, we want to be able to deploy many times a day. We want to be able to feature flag functionality. Um, yeah, we need to be able to respond very quickly. I like that, you know, you're talking about deploying n number of times per day, feature flags, 
Really good. Um, it sounds like, you know, pivoting, I guess, to that war on talent. How have you found, you know, your engineering tech stack? It, I guess, is it advantageous in attracting, uh, you know, developers, engineers, architects to join Webster? Um, previously, I, I worked at a bank. And one of the problems that we had at the bank is trying to get people interested in working on old tech. <laughs> I mean, they literally had mainframes <laughs> in the building, but um, even to say, hey, do you want to work on some, you know, 15, 20 year old Java code versus I can say, hey, do you want to work with the latest on that and the latest in React and all these cool cloud services? And by the way, we deploy really fast and we can, heck, even on your first day, you might even deploy something into production. All those things, you know, are, are really powerful because I ultimately developers, they want to build things. They want to get stuff out. They they take pride in or at least I do as a dev, you know, take pride in being able to to deliver. So if you get if you give them the sense that yes, I can, you know, move forward with my career and do all this new stuff and it's frictionless and I'll be able to get stuff done. Yes, that is a huge advantage, especially when we're competing against once again people like the banks, where they sort of solve that problem by throwing money at the, <laughs> at the problem. I think that's exactly right, Ben. You've got. Um, I think about the engineers that we have in our team. They are excited about being able to do stuff and have a clear line of sight between the stuff that they are doing and the stuff that they're working up and the stuff that's getting in uh, our customers' hands. Uh, you know, this is not some big amorphous uh, corporate. Mm -hmm. And so that is, uh, that is increasingly rare. And to your point about Working in a uh, in a nimble environment, uh, I sat on my uh, uh, our stand up this morning, our engineering stand up meeting, and uh, they were talking about some uh, some code that they want to uh, push out. And um, I said, oh, well, okay, we're not sure that we can get everything done out today, but uh, you know, we can um, let's do a release uh, towards the end of the day, and then we'll do pick up another one tomorrow morning. And so. Um, and it's really, really cool, I think, when it is the engineering team that is driving that and there's uh, a real culture there to to uh, with great initiative as opposed to a management driven philosophy. Yeah, totally. Uh, I think you know, in IT or maybe traditional IT, maybe back in the banks, uh, Ben, you know, talk about mean time to failure, uh, you know, MTTRs, mean time to recovery, et cetera. You know, a lot of organizations, and I wouldn't be surprised if Whipster have, you know, you want to get those developers to release to production as, you know, early as possible. Maybe they've got scorecards on, you know, meantime to commit into a source control platform to be deployed. All right, so the questions are coming in thick and fast here. So look, we can see that you've worked with some really large global companies, you know, and anyone can see that if you go to whipster.io. What has the process been like building relationships with these, you know, global behemoths? I can take this one. Yeah, I think, you know, going back to talking about innovation and just baking it into our process, one of the things we, part of our objectives and key results um, is being customer obsessed. Um, so yes, it's imperative to be able to innovate, but um, when we, especially when you're looking at the larger size of enterprise, uh, making sure that you're able to have everything that Ben and his team does on the back end clearly communicated from that first conversation, um, because then you're, you know, for us with limited resources and, and sales, um, being able to focus and, and get those in the funnel and down into actual paying customers is something we want to do efficiently and make sure the customer gets everything they need, but also that we're able to actualize revenue at the end of the day that keeps the lights on. So, <laughs> yep. But I guess it's also the um, with the large customers, we've seen that it can be a very uh, slow process. Like, for example, the if we're talking to another bank, we're trying to sell to them, they're very concerned about security. So that's part of the reason why we've gone down the SOC 2 path, because we can say, hey, we have the certification, which means that we've checked off a lot of those things that you're concerned about so that hopefully the process then is faster versus the having to send us, you know, 16 page questionnaires about, you know, tell me about your backups. Are you, are you training your security about the, the developers about security? We can say, well, SOC 2 takes care of a lot of that. But uh, yeah, I think inherent in all of that is uh, there is, with our bigger customers, certainly a, a, a very high touch need still. And so back in the early days, which predates my time with Whipster, uh, even though HQ was in Wellington, New Zealand, we did have to put people on the ground in, in the US and North America is our biggest market. And uh, that provides uh, both 
the perception and the reality that we have uh, good on the ground support there. So, and you know, I think with you know the rise of VC, uh, sometimes the importance of that is overlooked. It's really, really important to have people on the ground in the jurisdictions in which you do business. Nice one. Okay, so you've launched a new mobile offering. Mm. What additional considerations did you keep in mind now that you've launched on mobile as well? And I guess maybe the question, just to, to reword or paraphrase here, you know, what are the considerations around mobile? And it sounds like you know to have the same end user experience on both offerings. Yeah. Well, there's a very strong technical component of this. Um, I guess. Some of us are used to saying, hey, do you have, have an app you know, that works on my phone? But the problem with that is that, you know, oops, I need an Android app and I need an iPhone app. Oh, and on top of that, I need, you know, something for everything else, the web. Um, the trend nowadays is to try to ideally have one code base for that. Mm. Um, thankfully, with technologies such as, you know, PWAs, that's more of an option. And especially for an organization like ours, it not only it allows us to deliver faster because it's ideally one code base ideally for everything but it provides consistency as well so technically there is a there's a strong focus on that like for example if if i can avoid having a developer who only does ios but i can have a full stack developer instead who can work off everything that's you know highly advantageous to us yeah brilliant and so look for those who may be thinking what is a pwa so ben's referring to a progressive web app so rather than using say zwift for you know iOS to be able to create an app here, we're creating one code base that you know, works effectively everywhere, which you know, has been articulated. Having to manage multiple different code bases to deliver the same thing, yeah, that's a that's an admin overhead, and it's not really you know that business differentiating. So you know there is a world of uh, you know progressive web apps today. Yeah. Just uh, another point I'd, I'd add in there is. As we design for mobile, it's not just a case of replicating what you do on desktop. Uh, you want to think about the different persona and the different ways in which they're likely to consume mobile. Um, and so, you know, for us, that meant if we think about the way in which people collaborate, you have core users or administrators and they'll have the content and they'll share this out to multiple reviewers. And we knew that reviewers would be the ones who are far more likely to review stuff on the fly. And so we made the decision to design first and foremost with them. And in some ways that was uh, slightly counterintuitive because they're not necessarily the ones that give us the money. It's the, uh, the core administrators and admin users. But we know that traditionally reviewers are the weakest link. And if we can make it as quick and as easy as possible for them on mobile, then we reduce the time to review and uh, it helps uh, deliver the benefits that uh, our paying customers are looking for. Awesome. All right. Felt like someone wanted to add a few more comments to that. But look, I've got a question here. OK, Adam, you know, I've worked for an organization in the past, past where I was effectively working away from the mothership. So you're in the US. Ben and Jimmy are in Wellington here. You know, what are the challenges? Um, how are you finding working internationally for a company that's based out of New Zealand? Yeah, well, I mean, I think right now working remotely and working in general is challenging. <laughs> uh, there's there's so many things that are, you know, that you have to work around and try to make work virtually. So that adds a whole nother flavor to that lens. But yeah, so, you know, my my team here are based in the, the West, uh, the West Coast of the United States, coordinating with um, headquarters back in New Zealand, which is a day ahead and X amount of hours behind, depending on the when you're asking that question is is really challenging because then you know not only coordinating our internal meetings and what we have as our stand-ups but then how we deliver that to our um, rest of our international client base so working with their engineers security compliance sales and marketing um, between not just our group but their group and all the ones in between so um, it really is challenging and sometimes you know you work early you get up early you work a little bit later but um, that's the nature of business, I think, in general this, these days, but definitely in another layer of that when you're working with um, away from the mothership, as you say, and as your shirt kind of illustrates. Um, you know, wait till you add uh, Europe into the mix there, then that's that, you know, tricky time zone where someone's doing those midnight meetings. Um, all right, so here's another question here is, all right, so when working with teams across the globe, what processes have you had to put in place? 
Yeah, have there been any processes that you've had to put in place, given you know you are um, teams I'll, here? That I'll take this first and um, perhaps give an answer, which is uh, not what you might expect, but. Um, to, for me, what's really important is laying out what success, success looks like. And if you are really clear on that, we use, uh, Adam alluded to it earlier, we use OKRs um, as our way to spell out to the team what's really, really important. And to a large extent, we leave them to determine how they best go about that. And so that means not always rushing to systems and processes, but actually empowering teams to achieve those those results uh, and the way that they see best. Uh, nonetheless, though, Ben, you, you're going to tell me that actually we, we, we do have some processes that we do need uh, from a technical perspective. Oh, of course we do. I mean, like any tech shop, we're all very agile and um, we have all our you know, Slack or Microsoft Teams and Zoom and all those other tools that really enable us to communicate. And I guess just taking a step back, it is it is amazing nowadays that, you know, we often talk about the tyranny of distance. We're so far away. I mean, Australia is only 2,200 kilometers away. The West Coast of the United States is, I forget how many thousands of kilometers away. But with the technology we have nowadays, we can do this. And that's... Challenge is still time zones, unfortunately. So I guess that's despite all the technology we have, it's it, I think the biggest part of our processes is to try to be available and to also try to make sure we put in the time to communicate with each other. And sometimes that means that, yeah, we turn on the video and we remind ourselves that we're talking to people. Um, and at Whipster, we do things like um, we make sure we bring the Portland team at, at times into conversations and we make sure we can see each other. So we can try to have those, you know, sort of human conversations and not just those asynchronous conversations that we have via you know email and slack and you know azure devops tickets and stuff like this yeah though you're right those rhythms and rituals are really important aren't they um so I mean, all hands are some a concept that lots of people will be familiar with but um uh, we do ours once a month on a wednesday morning and uh one of the team comes in and Cooks breakfast for the rest of the team, and uh, we then sync up with uh, the the crew over in Portland, who, and in different time zone for you, obviously, but you, uh, I think, uh, have that, and then go out for for a drink afterwards with your your team, right? So, yeah. you guys have pancakes, and I think we have an adult sized beverage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where's my invite? Um, Ben, spoken like a true uh, CTO, there, asynchronous, you know, your your, your IMs are uh, versus you know those in-person events no it sounds really good i definitely feel like uh you know hopping on a plane coming over to wellington uh you know to have some food with you lot now um i think uh ben mentioned okr so if you're not familiar with okrs it's a goal setting framework uh objective and key results i think it was born out of google correct me if i'm wrong someone i'm seeing a few nods here so um you know think about like kpis etc i guess okrs are the the modern I guess more modern approach and it is a goal setting framework that a lot of tech organizations use today there is a book called measure what matters not a not a promo for it here um that you know talks about okrs all right um so look i'm based in australia here I, um one of our audiences asked actually talk about the i guess the new zealand tech startup land you know what's the landscape like of startups in new zealand so it's changed a lot over 10 years so uh 10 years ago when whipster was born it was i think best described as nascent there were uh, a handful of companies and then uh there was trading and i for full disclosure i was an executive trade me for about a decade but uh there weren't that many um, uh, burgeoning tech companies at that point. And so Whipster was born out of in a, a local accelerator. But uh, the um, it's come on in leaps and bounds since then. So you've got uh, uh, a lot of these uh, companies now like Zero and Trade Me and Time is another recent one who are now producing uh, great results. Uh, people are coming through that, learning what uh, hyper growth looks like uh, and 
taking their insights and their capital and seeding it elsewhere. And so uh, you've got a, a really nice circular effect here, which is happening in the local um, economy. Uh, and that, that is a bit of a Wellington centric view. You could uh, take uh, exactly the same view of uh, what's happening in Auckland as well. Yeah, yeah. I guess um, from my point of view, the, um, it seems like, especially with um, TradeMe, which is New Zealand's eBay, that really gave birth to a lot of these startups that Jimmy mentioned. So, for example, there is Timely, which is where I worked, and they were ex TradeMe people. And a lot of those ex TradeMe people then went off to help found Zero and a whole bunch of other companies. And then from there, it's just this been butterfly effect of more and more startups coming up. And there's been a lot of startups as well in, in New Zealand that have been raising, you know, significant amounts of money to grow. So, the the scene is growing quite a bit. And uh, in Wellington and in Auckland in particular. Okay, so look, I'm in Melbourne um, and in Melbourne, we're talking like places like Richmond and Cremorne are there, you know, tech startups, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, zero and the likes are kind of, you know, situated there in New Zealand, you know, is there a, is there, you know, the Silicon Valley-esque area or, you know, are these, is it Wellington and Auckland? I reckon that we must be in it because we're down the street from zero from trade me. <laughs> Finally, it was one street over. We're in a Wellington itself is a very compact city, but um, yeah, there's a lot in Wellington and especially in our part of the town that we're in. Would you agree with that, Jimmy? Uh, I, I would. Uh, you could throw a blanket over all those places. Uh, it's not that tough, but I think that is to some extent by uh, a consequence of the compact and small size of Wellington um, as, as anything else. I mean, you can walk from one end of the town to the other in kind of 10 or 15 minutes, so long as you're not blown over sideways. Yeah. So tell me, when you go to the local cafe in these areas, because this is my uh, experiences, in you know my local area is everyone you can you hear these conversations is everyone talking about api this microservice that react this yeah i reckon it's pretty common and if anything i don't want my staff to go to them because i don't want to get, <laughs> don't want to get poached <laughs> sounds like we need uh in-house catering okay <laughs> So look, I think that's all the questions we have time to answer right now. So, but we'll hang around uh, and chat a little longer, you know, if there are any final questions. So if you do have questions, pop them in the chat. So there are many uh, great takeouts from today's episode. In fact, to like summarize, my top three are, you know, Whipster, you know, they asked the question, is there a better way to do video collaboration? And there sure is, right? Their platform has brought a modern collaborative approach to video editing used by the world's largest brands today. Check them out, whipster.io. They've got a sensible tech stack. You know, they've got you know, a relatively small team, so they're reducing the operational impact and increasing their speed to market by using those higher order services. You know, it's event-driven architecture. They live the cloud dream. And many organizations don't, right? They'll move into cloud, they'll run VMs, kind of the same as a, you know, as a data center. But you know, Whipster's about not having idle servers running. So their architecture is about maximizing the benefits and you know, again, reducing that operational overhead. And then thirdly, you know, their approach to product and development is driven by data. You know, Jimmy mentioned net promoter scores. Um, I've heard, you know, APM or application performance monitoring, you know, to provide that shorter feedback loop, allowing Whipster to keep their finger on the pulse on what their users require on their platform. So look, I would love to say a big thank you uh, to Jimmy, Adam and Ben from the Whipster team for joining us all. And, uh, you know, for you, our listeners here today, we've had some great comments and questions come through. So if you are a startup interested in seeing how Microsoft can help you develop at your own pace, visit our Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub. Um, we'll pop a link in the chat or you can just pop that into your favorite search engine. Stay safe and well, and we'll see you soon in the next episode.